very excited to kick off the discussion this afternoon. As Kay mentioned, our theme for this year is Obstacles to Opportunities. And I think this next session really lives up to that premise. The title of this keynote is Pivoting During a Pandemic, Offering New Options to Consumers. Our speakers this afternoon are Jared Aachen, founder and CEO of Chop Local. Jared currently resides in Wayland, Iowa, where he raises 280,000 turkeys a year. Jared is a shareholder of West Liberty Foods, a turkey processing company and further processor of protein. Along with Jared, we have Katie Oltoff, a longtime advocate for agriculture and the co-founder of Chop Local. Previously, she served as Senior Director of Communications at the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. Before I officially turn things over to Jared and Katie, I have one more poll question for you that will, of course, relate to what they're going to share with us. We heard yesterday about some pandemic trends, and one of those was buying groceries online. So tell me, have you ever purchased meat online? Yes, all the time. You've tried it before. No, but you're open to. And no, and you don't really want to. We'll give you a second to cast your vote. All right, let's take a look at the results. Interesting, uh, so maybe promising for Jared and Katie. Uh, some of you have tried it or you do it all the time. A large percentage of you say no, but you're open to trying it. So maybe a new market that Chop Local can tap into. With that, I'm very excited to welcome Jared and Katie to the virtual stage for their keynote titled, Pivoting During a Pandemic, Offering New Options to Consumers. Again, please use that Q&A box to enter your questions for Jared and Katie. Take it away. Okay, while I get my screen up here, I just saw a note. Jared, make a note, we need to get some alligator tail on Chop Local because apparently it's hard to find for people. That one might, okay. might be difficult to find in Iowa, but I can travel to Florida to see if I can find some. <laughs> You'd be willing to do that, huh? Okay, <laughs> yeah, no. very good. Um, <clears throat> all right, somebody give us a thumbs up if you're seeing our slides here, just to make sure while we're getting you're started. You're good to go. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for the opportunity to share our story about Chop Local with you today. Uh, we have crammed a lot into the next uh, hour or so. We're gonna cover four main topics here. The first one is how Chop Local got started and how it works. Um, second, we're gonna let you get to know a few of our vendors, our farmers and butchers that we're working with. Then we'll share some of the lessons that we've learned about selling meat direct to consumer. And finally, we'll go over some of the more general lessons that we have learned from starting this business. So um, like Hannah just mentioned, she gave our quick introduction here, but here is a little bit more about Jared and I. Uh, Jared has a background in ag business and runs his farm. My background is more in ag communications. Uh, I've done quite a bit on the advocacy side, including um, authoring the My Family's Farm series for the Iowa Ag Literacy Foundation, as well as My Family's Soybean Farm, which is a children's book that came out recently from Farm Bureau's Feeding Minds Press. So be sure to look that up if you're interested as well. So I'm going to give a little bit more of a background about myself. That'll help set the stage for why uh, Chop Local is built and, and how it progressed over time. So like Ken had mentioned, a few things I'm going to touch on is I graduated from Iowa State University back in 2011. Um, I'm an owner and operator of a cooperative called Wesley Foods. Uh, we do a lot of further processing of multiple different proteins, not just turkeys. Um, since then, I've been involved in our family-owned feed mills and grain elevators, and uh, like Hannah said, we currently grow about 280,000 turkeys a year. Uh, my focus in the past has been driving efficiencies and operations to increase profit on a per-unit basis on my family farm, whether that be per flock, per pound, or per acre. Um, I've also worked hard to increase the revenue per unit as well. For example, Obviously, we want to increase our yield per acre um, every year, and I've taken some risks uh, as well on the livestock side to increase the revenue, primarily by raising antibiotic-free turkeys in the past few years. But for the most part in my farming career, I've played the same game as most farmers around me, 
It's either decrease cost or increase revenue, all within the constraints of, of modern agriculture. And for the most part, that has worked very well for me. I've been able to uh, have sizable growth on my farm and, and help guide efficiencies and direct nutrition in our feed mills as well. But then COVID struck. Um, May 2020, COVID had shut down restaurants across the nation. Me being in the turkey industry, you either sell birds on whole birds on holidays uh, or deli meat. Luckily, Katie and I are involved in a processor that sells deli meat. The only problem was we were selling to restaurants and obviously they were closed. Um, so I don't need to go into great detail about what happened to the industry. Uh, everybody here knows it was turned upside down um, and, and everybody understands the issues that we faced. Uh, but for me, it was truly amazing that when my back was up against the wall, how I, how wide my eyes had become and it, it started to show opportunities that were present at the time. And, and really it shined a light on how efficient the uh, meat processing industry had become, but it also became a very fragile one. So like Jared mentioned, uh, my family raises turkeys as well, but I've actually spent the last few years working in the cattle industry. So at the same time that we were worried about how the pandemic was going to affect our farm personally, the cattle producers I was working with were absolutely desperate for any way to market their fed cattle. Retail shelves were completely empty, uh, but we had plenty of cattle backing up on farms and no way to get it from point A to point B. And of course, being here in Iowa, our friends and neighbors were facing depopulation of pigs during that same time frame. And so if possible, what our farmers in Iowa did was they went and they booked as many locker appointments as possible to solve the problem on their side. And based on a pre-conference discussion we were just having, so the locker appointments means that they called up their local butcher and tried to get their animals in there. Obviously, they cannot... Um, through our local butchers, we cannot process mass quantities of livestock like a major processor or a packer would, uh, but they did try to alleviate some of the strain by using our local locker systems. And on the consumer side, what did they do when those shelves were empty? Well, the data shows us that many of them started purchasing meat online. A couple of those biggest retailers are ButcherBox and CrowdCow, but there's many other places where you can order meat online and consumers started doing that. Now, there's a lot of reasons why they were purchasing meat online that really have nothing to do with the pandemic. We've been seeing this grow over the past few years. And a big cause of that growth is that modern meat eaters, which is what we call them at Chop Local, are different from the meat eaters of the past. And I know you've touched on this a little bit already in the conference, but modern meat eaters want convenience. They are used to being able to order anything that they want with the click of the button and having it shipped to their door or taking advantage of click and collect services, which means that they order online and then they pick it up at a local retailer. Second thing we've really seen them looking for is quality. Um, I believe this was covered yesterday in a presentation too. They're willing to um, move up to a premium cut of meat. So Think about those hobby grillers and foodies. They want that impressive cut of meat that they can show off on social media, and they really want to enjoy it at home too. And then last but certainly not least, modern meat eaters want transparency and trust. They want to know that the meat that they're eating aligns with their values, and they want that information about the sustainability practices, the animal welfare practices, all of that info about the farms where their meat was grown. And really, the only way to transparently give them that info is by selling direct to consumer by farmers and butchers. Uh so let's dive in a little deeper into the transparency topic that uh, Katie was talking about. If, if you think about it, transparency has not only changed consumer behavior at the meat case, but it's also had a profound impact on business as a whole. One example that always comes to mind uh, for me is buying a new car. Before the internet, you had to search multiple dealerships and you can never really truly compare apples to apples. Many uh, slick car salesmen can make quick deals because their customers were not as well versed in buying a, a car as they were. Um, today, you can look up uh, the exact model of car and get prices all across the U.S. 
And if it's a used car, you can uh, even get the Carfax report and know the whole history of that car. So now the customer has the exact same information as the car salesman has, no longer giving that car salesman a leg up. And you've seen this happen a lot across dealerships is there's not, they're not willing to negotiate anymore because all those prices are transparent across the inter internet. So consumers are not nearly as brand loyal as well. Um, with the internet review system, getting feedback from uh, customers has made it easier to launch a new brand and gain tra traction if it's well liked. In the past, this uh, feedback review process was not nearly as easy and the, the customer base would tend to gravitate towards those reputable brands because they trusted them. This transition in doing business has changed and I, I feel like the meat industry has been somewhat slow to stay ahead of this, but I think uh, the tide is truly turning and, and we will see a transformation in the meat industry towards more transparency, like just like everything else. So we know that transparency is important to meat eaters, uh, but the reality surrounding COVID showed us that farmers couldn't access uh, uh, customers or consumers without a large corporation or two or three as middlemen in the supply chain. And if those corporations went down for whatever reason, the farmer had very, very few options. Now, these are farmers, lockers, and butcher shops out there that are trying to sell via alternative channels and get directly to the consumer, but they're, but they're using farmers markets, word of mouth, and uh, some social media uh, to slowly grow their business. They would like to get into this e-commerce sales, but their online website and marketing uh, come second. And many of these are mismanaged and, and marketing is truly non-existent. And lastly, uh, cold chain shipping is extremely expensive and you need economies of scale to be cost competitive, getting your product to the consumer. The farmer and the butcher are focused on running their business efficiently and delivering that quality product to the consumers. And they could really use a lot of support entering and operating in this space. So that's where we come in. Chop Local is what we call the Etsy of meat, which we've had several people recently tell us we should have named it Meatsy. So we're sorry that we uh, missed out on that opportunity. <laughs> but the Etsy of meat is an online marketplace where multiple small to mid-sized farmers and butchers can list their products online, really showcase their brand, and then customers can come and get the opportunity to see exactly who they're purchasing meat from and have access to local meat from a small business or a farmer on one platform no matter where they are in the United States. One of the things that's a little bit different about us is that we are a marketplace. We're not just helping farmers set up their own websites to sell their meat. Now, building a marketplace is a little bit more challenging than a simple e-commerce store, but because you have to serve both the vendor and the consumer, but we also know that it benefits both of those parties. The marketplace makes it easier for customers to find exactly what they're looking for, and we can serve a wide variety of customers. So instead of them searching multiple farm websites or smaller butcher shops websites for the meat they want, they can come to Chop Local and they can find anything they want. So again, if we have those hobby grillers that want that special cut, or maybe they really enjoy smoking a meat and they want something unique or special, they can find that on Chop Local. But we can also provide uh, options for the busy mom who wants the easy meals for her family. We have everything that anybody could want on the website. We also, by being part of a marketplace, we're better positioned to compete against other online retailers. So instead of having, again, dozens of individual sites trying to increase their search engine optimization and name recognition and get new customers, the marketplace really gives all of our vendors a leg up. And then finally, we offer vendor support that these farmers and lockers cannot get anywhere else. So our goal through Chop Local is really to enhance this method of moving meat to market. Independent farmers take their livestock to a small locker or butcher who then harvests and cuts the meat. Um, sometimes that meat will be labeled with the farm name and other times it'll be labeled with the butcher shop or locker's name, but then it ends up at the end user, the modern meat eater. 
so our vendors are both farmers and butchers. We have some of both, um, but either way, whoever the customer is buying from, they've avoided those large corporations, uh, the meat packers and the retailers that they're quite frankly, they're kind of wary of. And as e-commerce grows, we've given those farmers and small processors a chance to compete against the big guys online. Now, I hope as I was saying that slide, it didn't turn any of you off because we want to talk about how we, Jared and I, combine conventional and niche agriculture together. So our mission is to support an alternative supply chain that brings more values to, brings more value to farmers and small processors. But he and I are both fully entrenched in conventional agriculture as well. And we understand the benefits of the protein supply chain as it exists today. We both sell our turkey into that protein supply chain. We also know that sometimes um, it seems like those of us in conventional agriculture need to be worried about the marketing messages used by niche producers or niche retailers. However, one of the first decisions that we made as partners was that we would not allow any disparaging marketing to occur on our platform. So our vendors are free to use marketing claims like organic or grass-fed as long as they meet the USDA labeling requirements for those claims. But they cannot put down other farmers or production methods. So it's okay for them to say that they're antibiotic-free, for example, uh, but it's not okay for them to say, I don't pump my animals full of chemicals like other farmers, which is literally a statement that I saw on a prospective vendor's website. So it's really important to the two of us, Jared and I, that we support all types of production methods. And um, surprisingly, maybe it's surprising to you, it was surprising to us, the first vendors who joined our site use conventional practices and really couldn't claim any of those special marketing terms, but they were looking for another way to market their livestock and their meat and diversify their farm revenue. So we're trying to make that easier without pitting one segment of agriculture against another. For those farmers that Katie just talked about, as well as the small processors, uh, butcher shops and lockers we work with, uh, we talked a little bit about how we go above and beyond to help them. Um, so we not only provide this e-commerce platform or the, the marketplace, we, al we also offer them a lot of different tools. Um, we provide them with marketing tools that a lot of them don't even know exist. Uh, we walk them through all the regulations and requirements to sell direct to consumer, which is can be extremely complicated. Um, and the last thing we do is help them get their shipping costs down. This is where we can work together as a marketplace to uh, still have volume to get uh, costs like boxing and shipping that we can negotiate with those suppliers to get all those costs down for everybody. So that here again, we, we can compete against those large retailers. So for our vendors, uh, our platform makes it very easy to get on and start selling today. Uh, it's, it's really as easy as setting up a new email. They set up an account on our platform, they link their bank account, and then list their products. And then they watch for sales notifications, uh, whether that customer is going to pick up or uh, have it shipped to their door. So for the customers, they can come to choplocal.com, they can browse hundreds of products, or they can look and shop vendor by vendor and find out more about who they're buying from. Then they choose, like Jared said, choose pickup options, or if they want to have it shipped, the farmer or butcher will pack it in an insulated cooler. We use gel packs or ice packs to keep it cold and make sure that it arrives frozen. And then finally, that customer gets to enjoy that high quality meat that they were able to get conveniently while supporting a small business or a local farmer. So here's a short history uh, timeline of events. Uh, in late 2020, uh, we hit the ground running just in time for holiday sales. And so we sold some uh, fresh turkeys from another Iowa turkey farmer for Thanksgiving with great success. We brought on four small vendors just in time for Christmas sales. And I mean, literally, I think we launched um, on Thursday and they had to ship it by Tuesday for it to get there uh, for Christmas. So it was really quick turnaround. But we had great success with prime ribs, Christmas gift boxes, that type of thing. 
Then since January 1st, we've really been focused on adding new vendors, getting ready for the big meat season. You know, grilling season is upon us now and going to be continuing for a few months. And we currently have about 20 active vendors on the site from three different states. So here's a little bit of data from our first six months of business that we thought you would be interested in. Um, over 50% of our customers have been male. The vast majority of them have been here in the state of Iowa, but we have shipped some, uh, we have shipped some orders across the country to different states. About just over 50% have been what we consider hyper local, which means that they're really close enough that they could either pick up at the farm or the farmer could deliver to their house. Um, and that goes along with our over 50% of our orders were for pickup. Uh, our average age, based on a little internet sleuthing, we think that the average age of our customer is somewhere in the mid 40s. So it'll be interesting to see over the next few months um, if these trends stay the same or if things change a little bit. We're seeing some differences now that uh, more people are vaccinated and things are opening up. The weather's a little bit nicer here in Iowa. And so um, it may change some of these, both the demographics, the age, as well as I think it, it could affect pickup versus shipping. So as we grow, we really hope to connect our vendors with more opportunities, not only on the retail space, but food service sales and wholesale to other retailers as well. Uh, we also see Chop Local, Chop Local's platform as a great opportunity to test smaller batches of a new product to, to get a new product introduced into the protein uh, market quicker and get that customer feedback that we had mentioned earlier to uh, maybe launch a new product. So right now, we see a lot of trends that are really working hand in hand and kind of helping Chop Local along. So like we said, direct to consumer meat sales have been on the rise, um, increasing increased from $1.5 billion in sales in 2018 to 2.5 in 2019. Haven't seen a firm number for 2020, but I'm sure it's even higher than that. At the same time, e-commerce growth has been growing just in general. Um, the growth has been really astronomical, again, partly because of the pandemic, but really it's an upward trend for the past few years. And along with that, FedEx and UPS seem to be doing a better job of getting products from point A to point B in a really timely fashion. We actually, you know, shipping was kind of a mess before Christmas and we thought, this is crazy. We're going to start shipping out meat the week before Christmas and hope it gets there on time. And we had no issues. Everything got there when it needed to be. Um, they're also investing in cold chain shipping. So vaccine distribution meant that they put a lot of things in place that weren't there before to get cold products where they needed to go. And then finally, meat processing capacity. This came up in an earlier discussion too. So I think um, Jared and I are not the only ones that see the value of this alternative supply chain and the value of having small and medium-sized processors in our rural communities. And so we've seen um, some projects funded in the state of Iowa to either expand small processors to get them new equipment, um, but we've also seen a wave of legislation to support them as well. So whether that's at the federal level, there are some pieces of legislation looking at uh, increasing the number of small processors who can uh, legally sell meat across state lines um, or things like Iowa has a bill working on um, increasing training for butchers. And so a lot of support in that arena as well. We think you bring all these things together and it positions Chop Local to be truly disruptive in the coming years. So uh, the next thing we're going to get into is talk a little bit about our vendors. And uh, when, when we've been starting Chop Local, you get into points where it's really stressful. Uh, there may seem like there's no light at the end of the tunnel just from the startup culture. You're building a whole Jared, brand new business. You weren't supposed to say that till later in the presentation. Well, I know, but this is what <laughs> I'm getting into is that every time we get in one of those holes, we go meet with a vendor or we go out to their farm to shoot some pictures and we reminded ourselves why we were doing this. And it was really important that we include these slides about what vendors we have today uh, in our presentation, because this is why we're doing it. And, and it's really, it's really been uh, 
it's been good for Katie and I to be able to meet these vendors and visit their farms. So the first one I'm going to start talking about is Beerman Bacon. And, and the reason they're the first one is because they were our first vendor on Chop Local. Um, Tim Beerman and his brother, Matt, came up with the idea of these flavored bacons. Uh, Tim runs the farm in North west iowa and he's also served as the national pork board he served on the national pork board in 2009 uh tim and matt launched beerman bacon in 2019 just before uh coming on chop local as our first vendor uh just a note that his farm is conventional and the bacon is cured traditionally but our customers love it and our favorite my favorite bacon is the uh, jalapeno and and it's really awesome yeah. Side note. Um, so the jalapeno bacon is awesome. Tim Bierman is also picking up something for me on Facebook swap as we speak. <laughs> so back to what Jared was saying, we create those relationships that truly has been the best part of this. Okay. Back, back on, on the script here. Um, so thanks to Jennifer Scheich and Farm Journal's Pork, you may have already heard of Brewer Family Farms. Uh, the brewers live in central Iowa and they raise pork and cattle. And again, just like Beerman's, they use conventional agriculture practices and their pigs are raised in confinement. So in addition to the cuts of beef and pork, uh, they also have a lot of further processed items. Uh, specifically, they have a, a beef brats that are caseless and they serve those at festivals and rag Bry, which is the big bike ride across Iowa. They serve those all over the place in the summer. They're a huge favorite. And so we're really excited to be able to offer those online now so people come and you know try their brats at at a summer event and then they can order them for home too uh, the brewers also take part in a couple of big farmers markets uh, near des moines so the next one is wg provisions uh, this is a local business based in ames iowa they do have a couple of other small processing plants in in a couple other towns surrounding uh, ames they offer pre-cooked smoked meats for food service, but like many other companies, they had to pivot in 2020 um, as those restaurants closed and began, began offering their meat direct to consumer uh, in 2020. Their uh, pre-cooked options include shredded pork, shredded beef, smoked brisket, and burnt ends. Uh, the shredded beef is the same beef that's used in the famous hot beef sundaes at the Iowa State Fair. So if you're an Iowa State fair goer, you've probably tried their product. Um, they also own Iowa rabbit, which are meat rabbits raised by the Amish farmers in here in the Midwest uh, that you can also order on Chop Local. So we don't have alligator tail, but we do have rabbit. Mm hmm. And side note, we had at our house, we had WG Meatbox's beef barbacoa last night for Cinco de Mayo. And it's pre-cooked, so all you have to do is heat it. And I personally just microwaved it, and it was so good. I was literally, like, standing at the counter eating it um, as it was coming out of the microwave. So another great option. Okay, Old Station Craft Meats. So Old Station Craft Meats is a new butcher shop uh, in one of the fastest growing suburbs of Des Moines. They launched the same time that we did right before Christmas. And they have a wide variety of products. Um, they have a meat case that, you know, and they are, they are breaking down carcasses from local farmers in the back cutting room. But then they also in their freezer section, they have some of those other products that have some of those specialty marketing claims, like organic chicken, um, they carry some antibiotic free Berkshire pork. Um, because they have such a wide variety, they've had a lot of success through Chop Local with shipping orders. Um, but we also serve as their platform for pickup orders. And so a lot of um, people in the metro area will order online and then just run in and grab their order real quick on their way home from work or something like that. Uh, Case and Family Farms is a little newer to us, uh, but they're also a little different. They are really active in showing pigs and their market pigs are the ones that didn't make the cut to the show. So um, unlike brewers and beermans, the pigs aren't raised in confinement barns. However, like Katie and I, Casins have one foot in the world of conventional agriculture and one foot in the world of niche agriculture. And Brett Kaysen is the vice president of sustainability for the National Pork Board, but he assures us that this is the kids project. 
Uh, I just had the opportunity last week to try Beerman's uh, or Kaysen's brats, and they are really, really good. They're, I'm not a big brat fan, and they're the best I've ever had. Same. I'm not a big brat fan either, and I ate two. So that tells <laughs> yeah. you how good they are. Um, and yes, I believe Brett is on the board for Animal Ag Alliance too, but he told us this is the girls' project, and he didn't want it to seem like, you know, we were, um, uh, you know, promoting him unfairly over any of the others, but okay. So we have, um, we have the rabbit. We also have shrimp that is grown in an abandoned outlet mall off of interstate 35 in central Iowa. <laughs> so Midland Co is an Iowa based startup. They are trying to create a contract growing system for shrimp in the Midwest. And so right now they're doing research in this old abandoned outlet mall. That's where their facility is. And as they test their technology, they are harvesting shrimp intermittently. And so we are managing their shrimp sales and they actually have a huge wait list. So we're managing that as well. And that has been a really great partnership for us. I have not been able to try the shrimp yet because I think I'm about six months deep on the wait list. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to it, even though I do. Yeah, we do all the marketing. I'm still at the end of the line, I guess. So um, the last last but not least is uh, the farmer's turkey, which is uh, the business that I have started while building Chop Local. And it's not quite launched yet, but uh, we're getting very, very close. Um I'm going to have options like uh, pre-cooked uh, shredded turkey that are great for tacos and sandwiches, a turkey roast that uh, is really easy to cook at uh, two to three pounds a piece, and the State Fair famous marinated turkey tenderloins uh, will all be able to be shipped to your door anywhere in the U.S. Yeah, so so watch for that. We need to have a wait list for Jared's turkey, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so that, that, those were a handful of our vendors. We have several others. Um, those vendors are all offering retail cuts that can be sold across state lines. We can ship them anywhere in the country. Um, we also have some vendors that are coming on that are going to be offering uh, what we call custom butcher, which is a half or a quarter or a whole beef or pork. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. But for this section, we know that there may be farmers watching who want to sell direct to consumer. We also know that you may work with farmers who want to sell direct to consumer. So here's a little bit about what we have learned so far from Jared going through the process to get the farmer's turkey up and running, as well as the vendors that we work with on Chop Local. So the first thing that I talk to prospective vendors about is the regulations and inspection. And if they don't know anything about the regulations, that means it's probably going to be several months before they are at the point that they can sell retail cuts. So we have four different approved methods of butchering through a locker in Iowa, and I'm going to try to explain them. Uh, the first one is what we call custom butcher. And this means that the locker is butchering for the livestock owner's own use. So I could take in one of my steers and have it butchered and bring the meat home and stick it in my freezer. Now, I could also sell half of my steer while it's alive and the new owner and I could work together to have it butchered by a local locker. And then we could bring home the meat to our own freezers, but we could not sell it to anyone else at that point. So a lot of farmers in Iowa go this route um, and, and we call this custom butcher, but they're selling a half or a whole or a quarter of the animal. Uh, and then that meat is just going to that one other buyer. Okay. State inspected facilities and state inspected slaughter means that there is an inspector from the state of Iowa present for the harvest, and that meat can be sold to consumers within the state of Iowa. And then there's federally inspected, which means that a USDA inspector is present for the harvest, and that meat can be sold anywhere in the United States. Then there is the new Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program, CIS program. So under CIS, state inspected facilities and harvests can be sold the same way that federally inspected products can, meaning that, again, the products can go across state lines and into food service. So 
in order for a facility to qualify for this, first, the state has to be accepted into the program at the federal level. And there are eight states that are approved right now. And then the individual facilities go through an additional approval process. Um, now, we're not on the locker side, so I don't know all the ins and outs of this, but my understanding is that the CIS uh, requirements are, are not quite as, um, it's not quite as difficult to become approved for CIS as it is for federal, even though the uh, levels of, you know, food safety and that type of thing are the same. I think it has to do with having a state inspector versus a federal inspector there in the facility. So, like I said, all of the farmers and butcher, all of the, the farmers that we listed earlier, the vendors that we listed earlier, they're using a federal or a CIS facility, meaning that we can ship their products anywhere in the U.S. So again, if you hop on Chop Local and, you know, that rabbit looked really amazing to you, go ahead. You can place your order. They'll get it sent out to you. Uh, farmers will also need a warehouse license to store their products. So once, uh, if they're a farmer and once they've had that meat processed through that federal, federal or state inspected facility, in order for them to store it before they ship, it, they need to have that warehouse license. And then if they're using their own label, they need to um, go through the state department of inspections and appeals to have it approved before they can utilize it. So then the next one of the next questions we get asked frequently is about pricing and, and where, where and how to price. So farmers tend to know their processing costs, but they don't always know their production cost, and not very many of them factor in the costs related to actually selling their meat. So we encourage them to include that in their total sales price as well. Uh, those costs include th things like uh, liability insurance, uh, specifically for selling food, which majority of the time is not covered under your general farm liability policy. Uh, and then there's marketing costs. Even if a farmer is not doing any advertising at all, things like flyers and business cards do cost money and need to be included in those costs. Uh, then there's e-commerce. If they have a website, uh, most paid a fairly significant amount to get the site up and running and then continue to pay a monthly fee just to maintain it. And if they are taking electronic payments, they are going to have to pay some sort of transaction fee as well on the back end of your website to accept those payments. Uh, and then there's transportation shipping. We're going to go a little bit deeper into this as it's a very, very important part of uh, selling e-commerce. But uh, what we found right now is that on average, uh, you need to get your order up to about 15 pounds of meat, depending on the cost. Um, and that will then cost you about $1.50 to $2 per pound of ship. So, you know, 10 to 15 pounds is kind of the, the maximum profitability or the maximum um, efficiency you can get out of packing that cooler for the cost of the cooler. So that includes the box, cooler, coolant, and postage that you're going to maximize that cost at that poundage rate. Um, when talking with potential vendors, some of them struggle to add cost of shipping into their sales price. Uh, but what's interesting is they will drive all over the place to deliver their meat. So one example we have is a farmer who drove 60 miles one way to deliver one package. And this was a vendor that was arguing with us that, that she can't afford to ship. And, but if you'd really figure up her cost at just a, the federal mileage rate, she spent $67 and 20 cents to deliver that meat. And that doesn't even include her time. Uh, so if she value your time at $10 an hour, it's, it's going to cost another $20 just to deliver that package. She would have been much more cost effective to put that in the mail. Her package probably would have cost somewhere between $20 to $25 all in cost to ship that package. So people are very scared of shipping, which we'll discuss a little bit later, but it's, it's not as scary as they need to think it, think it is, I guess. Um, so the last thing is time. Uh, it's funny how working with some of our vendors, they don't value their time as much as they should. So, you know, a lot of them sell via Facebook, text messages, phone, and keeping all that record keeping, they do not keep track of the amount of time that it takes to, to do all that. For sure. Okay, so selling via e-commerce. Here's what farmers need to know. So 
there's a few different ways that they can go about setting up their online shop. Um, a lot of them kind of skip that and they do just sell through their Facebook page or Instagram. They take orders through messages and they take payments through PayPal and Venmo. And that can work to a certain extent. It does get harder to manage and it can be really hard for them to reach new customers in that way. And so really they want to have a website if they're going to be doing this seriously. Um, but not, you know, just having a website, that's not the silver bullet. There are literally thousands of farm websites across the United States selling meat direct to consumers. And so there's a lot of competition there. And so then the question becomes, how does an individual farmer rise to the top of that competition? So this is where they start to struggle um, because I think we mentioned earlier, we provide marketing for them that they literally don't even know exists. They need to have a good website. They need to have some blog posts and their metadata included so that they can really take advantage of search engine optimization. And then if they get traffic to the site, then they have to convince the customer to buy. And so that um, brings in things like really great photos and product descriptions and a little bit of knowledge of e-commerce conversion rate optimization. Um, simple things like what color the buy button should be and where it should be placed and what information needs to be included in the listing are really important. One of the things that we see most when we're looking at other farmers' websites is that the shipping price is not evident to the customer until you're nearly all the way through the checkout, which leads to a lot of abandoned carts. Um, they, the technology as a whole, software development as a whole, has also not come up with a great way to handle selling meat by exact weight online. And so some of the most popular platforms require two transactions if you want to sell the meat by exact weight. So the customer comes and they place basically a small deposit on the meat. And then the farmer goes, let's say it's a roast, the farmer goes and they get the roast out of the freezer and they look at the exact weight, they type in the the ex rest of the purchase price. And the customer has to come back and complete that transaction again, which in any other industry in e-commerce, they would never, ever do that. It's it's uh, like suicide for e-commerce. You want them to get that transaction done as quickly as possible. And so that's another struggle that farmers have when they're selling online. Um, then things like email marketing, build that list, actually use it is really important too. And so these are some of the things that we either coach farmers on or some of the things that we are doing for them and helping them do when they become part of the CHOP local community. So now I'm going to loop back to shipping because this is the, what we get at, this is the most questions we get asked from our vendors. It's the scariest part of doing e-commerce is, is the shipping part. Um, it takes a lot of research and testing, but it can be done and it can be done cost effectively. If getting into sh shipping frozen meat, um, through a carrier like FedEx or UPS, the first thing you want to do is find out where um, where their ground transit can reach. The only cost-effective way to ship meat is through ground transit. And I'll, like Katie had mentioned before, FedEx and UPS are getting really good at hitting one to two day um, shipments in, in, in uh, very quickly. So I know out of Iowa, UPS can hit 60, almost 60% 60 of the population in two days using ground transit. So um, once, once you've looked at that map and chose the carrier, you can either go and negotiate a discount with that carrier, or you can use a national shipping service that will get you those discounts as well. Discounts up to 60 to 70%. Uh, the last thing you need to do is find um, discounted or cost effective ways to box it, whether it's for short term or long term, how you pack, pack your box will help you save money to eliminate spoilage and also eliminate overpacking if it isn't necessary. The key to shipping is volume. The more volume you ship, you can get substantially larger discounts in coolant and boxing, as well as negotiating those uh, rates with the shipper. Okay, so we're on to part four here. Um, we've learned a lot about selling direct to consumer, but we have also definitely had our challenges. And so we want to talk a little bit about what business is like as a startup. So January 1st, 
uh, this early spring is typically a slow time for meat sales in general. And that was definitely the case for us. And it was kind of a little bit of a wake up call for Jared and I, and we started to uh, take a crash course in startup management. So the whole idea of a startup is that it's not just a new business, but it's a new business that's operating with a lot of uncertainty. And so normally a restaurant or a farm isn't considered a startup because you can model your business model on other businesses that have been successful and that it's been proven over time. But startups at the beginning, you don't even know what your product is or who your target market may be and whether or not you can combine those two things to actually make money. So what you do is you do a series of small tests and experiments over and over and over again until you become successful. So what we have focused on quite a bit here is trying to shorten the learning cycle. You've got to assess really quickly if what you are doing is making progress or not. Because if you don't, if you, if you take too long to make that assessment, um, your business is going to fail pretty quickly. And so, like I said, our goal is to shorten the learning cycle and move the needle towards success a five minute warning to make sure we have time for questions. So just a five minute reminder. Thanks guys. Sounds good. So as many of you listening, uh, come that you come from well-established businesses and I want to touch on how you can continue to do small tests as a startup, uh, to form a startup culture inside your business. And this doesn't have to be a radical change. Like Katie had mentioned, uh, startups deal with a lot of uncertainty and they operate their business more like a flow chart with a series of questions that need answered to help guide strategy. Whereas an established business uh, more works on a linear path and you can project out that future much more clearly. It really wasn't until I started Chop Local that I realized I'd went through all the stages of a startup when I first started farming. Uh, I was small and could try different strategies. So I tried different techniques on ventilation and watering systems in my barn. And I also looked at uh, experimenting in cover crops and nutrient management on the row crop side. I failed a lot. Uh, at certain points, I felt like it would, uh, I was on the bleeding edge instead of the cutting edge. Um, it would have been much easier to just follow the status quo and do what everybody else was doing. But through those failures, I really started to be, uh, start to understand the principles and, and learn what was actually going on. And, and I truly learned a lot. So um, I think it's, in, you know, can you think of some uncertainty inside your core business and can you implement tactics of a startup to help guide you down the correct path to solve some of those problems using small tests that maybe only cost 500 to $1,000 to help guide you through the process to lay out a series of uh, what works and what doesn't. I challenge each of you in your business to lay out, um, you know, how this might work. And this can range anywhere from marketing all the way to operations. So here's a quick example from Chop Local. We wanted to test our assumptions and find out which of our three main value propositions resonated the most with customers. So there's a few ways we could have gone about doing this. We could have launched a large advertising campaign and waited a few weeks for the results. We could have worked with a focus group to get their opinions or spent literally thousands of dollars on market research to find out what the existing research says. But instead, we spent $40 and one hour of time to launch three simple Facebook ads. One was focused on transparency, um, which for us is getting to know the farmers and showing, you know, putting that face to the food. One was focused on convenience and one was focused on quality. And within a couple of days, we knew really quickly uh, that that transparency was what was resonating most for our customers based on the percentage of people who were clicking on the ads. Transparency came out way ahead of the rest. So now that we have that lesson under our belt, we're on to these next questions. And again, designing fast and inexpensive tests to find out this information and help guide us with a lot of different decision-making pieces in our very young business. So not only can we implement some of these tactics uh, of a startup inside of our current business, but we think it's extremely important for us to continue to progress as a, fit, as a profession that we support egg startups as well. Uh, we're seeing a lot of states and universities supporting this style of growth in agriculture, 
Uh, but it is important that we adapt to the high speed, the high speed culture of a startup so that we can be competitive and stay relevant in this industry. We have seen plant-based protein companies and tech companies uh, in ag get started in Silicon Valley. Where and how can we base uh, build this based in agriculture for agriculture? And are we all willing to support it together? So referencing back to one of the startup culture or startup categories that Jared just mentioned, we think that direct marketing and increasing transparency is one of the best ways for the livestock industry to compete against alternative proteins. Now, we know that many customers who purchase plant-based proteins are doing so because they believe it's better for the environment, better for the animals, and better for society. But they also believe that meat coming directly from a farmer or a smaller processor meets those same criteria. So instead of buying plant-based protein, now they have an easier way to buy real meat that they perceive in a much better light. And so for the customers who are purchasing meat less often, they're also going to want to make sure that their splurge is worth it, meaning that it's high quality and a taste doesn't leave anything to be desired. And so we like to think that our farmers and butchers are going to be a vegetarian's cheat day. And along that customer buying journey, we have the opportunity to advocate for agriculture and share concrete examples of the hard work and dedication of livestock producers, no matter where they are and what production methods that they use. So as the rest of the supply chain moves towards more efficiency and consolidation, we see a lot of reasons for optimism surrounding chop local and direct marketing meat. So the last point that we're going to leave you with today uh, is, is something that Jeff Bezos said from Amazon. And as, as I started, as Katie and I, or specific, specifically me at first, started building Chop Local as a marketplace, I started doing a lot of research on different marketplaces, such as Amazon. And uh, I read this article last month uh, from when Jeff Bezos stepped down as the CEO of Amazon. I thought it fit really well into this presentation. Um, he tasked the future of Amazon to not be typical. The world changes at a much faster rate with the progress of technology. Uh, the world wants you to be tech typical and conform to the standards, but the only way to stand out is to not be typical and drive that innovation. In the past, if you would have quit innovating, you uh, may have become a dinosaur in something like 20 years, uh, and you would have enjoyed profits along the way. Truly today, it's probably more like two. Um, how you stand out in the future and bring value to your customers, your employees, your employer, and your shareholders, um, how will you do that? Uh, going back to the beginning, I had discussed how COVID was an eye-opening experience for me. I had felt like um, I had operated in the status quo for so long, and it took a disruption in the market to make me look at alternatives and what can we change to get better and serve our consumers. Katie and I plan to continually look at how we bring value to everyone involved in the farm-to-fork arena and, uh, and continue to use our experience in the startup culture to not only build Chop Local, but to support growth in the ag sector as well. So that's what we have for you today. Chop Local was formed by farmers for farmers. And we, again, appreciate this opportunity to share our story with you. We're honored to be a part of this conference. Um, we'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Awesome. I, I love that. Don't be typical. Maybe that's our summit 2022 theme that we've stumbled <laughs> upon. Very aspirational. That's awesome. Uh, I want to start the Q&A and your last couple of slides really got to this, but I want to give you the opportunity to expand. Um, you know, I think you made us all very hungry. I'm sure a lot of people probably clicked over to the Chop Local site and maybe made a purchase, but that's obviously not our goal for this afternoon. So for our very varied audience, if there's anyone kind of wondering, you know, what's my takeaway from this? Let's zoom out from this awesome case study we heard about. What's my action item wherever I sit in the animal agriculture community? What would you say that is? What's your number one to-do list uh, for everyone that's joining us today? You're asking us? Yes. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, Jared just touched on it. Like Jared is a good risk taker. And, um, and so being willing to step outside of his comfort zone and really look at 
I'm sorry, I'm speaking for him. I do this a lot. People that know <laughs> me here wouldn't be surprised. Um, but, you know, looking last last spring, like we said, there was no place for our turkey to go. And Jared started thinking about, well, how could I get my turkey to market? How could I get it to a customer? Uh, and played around with a lot of different ideas and Chop Local was born. And um, I'm not as big of a risk taker. So I appreciate that in working with him. Uh, but I think that that's one of the key things to take away is that it, sometimes we have to break out of this mold that we're in, in agriculture uh, and do something a little bit different in whether that's on the farm level to diversify your income or on the bigger level, kind of what we're doing. I think it's important. I'm going to yeah add to that just a little bit. So I hear so much in, in animal agriculture, especially, you know, the consumers should, should want this. We need to educate the consumers. Well, how do we do that? Cause they're not going to want to sit down and take a, a class on, on what agriculture is. They don't have the time. Everybody's in a hurry. So, you know, I think the biggest take takeaway you can be is we have to find innovative ways to continue to be competitive in the industry uh, against plant-based protein. You know, it, it's there. It has a lot of backing from California out in Silicon Valley and, and that's where the startup culture and driving this innovation is extremely important. And to go along with that kind of educational or consumer engagement aspect, Katie, I know when you and I first talked, one of the things I, I just loved about the Top Local website is that stance that you've taken of market your products, you know, compete however you want to, but we're not going to have disparagement of other production methods. That's, you know, not who we want to be. So there's a question here at the top of the Q&A box of how do you handle it if prospective vendors are already doing that kind of marketing? And I'll add on to that, you know, what kind of reaction have you gotten to that policy? Do you get any pushback to it? And Jared's laughing, so I think he might have an answer to this. So tell us more about that approach. So shockingly, like I would say we have not had that problem the way that we expected. Um, and it's funny because, so I did mention one prospective vendor that had a statement that would not be allowed on our site. Um, there was a, another prospective vendor that sent me their vendor description the other day. I have not addressed it with her yet, but I, um, you know, I edited the Iowa Cattlemen's Magazine for five years. I'm very comfortable cutting out people's words. Um, and so, so I edited that description and that's what will go on the website. And if she has a problem with that, she can figure out another solution. Um, and so that's been really kind of refreshing, um, that we haven't had that problem that we expected. Um, we've also had this discussion though, like is local, this was on one of the slides is local and kind of that direct from the farmer, is that strong enough? Or are people looking for specifically for those terms? And if local is not strong enough, and we feel continued pressure to use those types of marketing terms, I mean, Jared said to me when we were having this discussion, well, then, then we decide if we're going to keep doing this or not. Like that's, that's where the line in the sand is for us. Um, you know, and like I said, Jared raises antibiotic free turkeys. We plan to put on his products that these are antibiotic free. Is that the biggest selling point? Absolutely not. Um, these are really great convenience items and, and turkey's a great protein. You know, that's what we'll be focused more on. I hope, did that answer the question? Yeah, I think that that's definitely what I wanted to hear more about. Um, Jared, did you have anything to add on that note? No. So there's two questions here. One, are you seeking investors? And two, are you seeking vendors and specifically outside of Iowa? Yes, to, yes, to both. both. <laughs> <laughs> we, I don't, I, I don't know if we're supposed to announce this yet, but the egg startup engine, uh, we found out this week that the egg startup engine at Iowa state will be investing $50,000 in chop local. Uh, so we plan to use that to continue to develop our platform. There are several things like that sell by weight aspect that we want to develop, make it easier for our vendors. Uh, we plan to use that towards marketing as well. And so we're really excited about that. Uh, so definitely open to more investors as well as vendors would love to talk to you about that as well. If there are people out there, or you know, somebody. We do have a lot of farmers uh, on the line today, so I'm sure there will be a lot of interest. This is a very quick question. I know this comes from a web person, so I'm sure they're dying to know what color should a buy button be since you mentioned that was something <laughs> bright. <you> <laughs> so I, the, the, the example here is that we had, um, 
another farmer that I know that had her own site and I went there and I was trying to find the shop button and it was the whole site was like black and white and gray and the shop button was gray and I couldn't find it like and so she has since changed that color um but you want to make those big call to action buttons those need to be a bright color and that needs to be the only thing or, or mostly the only thing that that is that color on your screen at that time so that it really stands out needs to bring your attention right to that button big and bright got it uh, so during one of our policy pre-conference webinars, there was a discussion about one of the inspection options for meat conflicting with U.S. trade agreements with other countries. Uh, so more of a technical question here. Is that a concern for you or is it something you address with vendors when you discuss regulations? So, you know, I worked for the Cattlemen's. I'm not as up on policy as I used to be. Um, but we're not planning on exporting anything. So to us, what other countries are, are talking about is a little bit different, but I do understand there's a lot of um, intricacies surrounding that. Um, what's frustrating to us right now, just in a nutshell on the regulatory side is that state by state is so different. Um, so what we just told you about in Iowa might not stand in another state. The other thing is that in Iowa, we work with the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Inspections and Appeals, and they uh, often contradict each other in what they are telling us. And it's not clear where to go to find the information. So that's a big piece too. I guess we're focused more on how does this apply to our farmers on a day-to-day -day basis versus what are these major policy decisions that could affect trade? We know, trust me, we know that international trade adds a lot of value to livestock producers too. So we wouldn't want to jeopardize that. I think this, this question here is a perfect wrap up. So I'll start with you, Jared. What is the key message that you would tell Mark Cuban on Shark Tank if you were <laughs> pitching at Chop Local? You know, I would, I would go back to our slides. Uh, Katie and I talked about this a lot. We've pitched to quite a few investors already. And I think the thing that resonates the most is go back to those slides of the vendors and really showcase those vendors and what they're doing and tell, you know, telling Mark Cuban that we are trying to get these farmers messages to mass media and we're going to do that together. And Katie. Oh, I totally agree. Jared's made me into a shark tank junkie, actually, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm constantly like critiquing their business models and their valuation and things like that. So, um, but totally agree. That's what we found that has resonated is that really connecting it directly to the farmer, um, you know, posting pictures of the kids with the animals and things like that has made a big difference. We know that we can't compete on price. And, and we know that the products are awesome, but without somebody being able to taste test them, it's really hard to convey that on the internet. And so our differentiator is that we are working with a, a different supply chain than what you can get at a major retailer. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jared and Katie, for that awesome case study of an obstacle to an opportunity and what some lessons are to all of us in the animal agriculture community.